Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jojo. I'm a very grateful, very fortunate alcoholic. I'm glad they turned that air conditioner off because <clears throat> it's it's terrible to have to pee. <laughs> but it's even worse when you're cold and you have to do it. <laughs> I want to thank you for asking me to come up and share with you once again in Sacramento. I just left a conference in Los Angeles where there was over 650 women. And the theme of their weekend was the journey. And this one is celebrate life. Now, you want to talk about a miracle, that I'm going to be able to tell you where I just come from and where I'm at today. And that's truly the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I look at it, and I look at you women, and I think, my God, look how beautiful we are this morning. I mean, we are all beautiful. There's a whole room full of women, and God knows what we could be doing this morning. (laughs) I want to thank the previous two speakers that came up and shared, because I know how hard it is to get up and share, and you get a little nervous, and I get a little nervous, and... um, I remember I used to say that I don't get nervous when I speak, you know, but uh, I do. I still get a little nervous. But I'm really and truly glad to be here, and I, you know, and I know that you guys um, want to know what what's going on in my life. And I tell you, I want to tell you, because <laughs> the more I talk about it, the better it gets. You know. I want to share with you that Alcoholics Anonymous is my life. It has been one day at a time. I've always made it a priority, and I've been able to stay sober, no matter what has gone on in my life. And I've had some shit that has gone on in my life. Now, I also need to tell you that if you haven't heard or you don't know, is that if you notice those other two women got up here, and they were cute. I mean, they didn't use any profanity. I need to forewarn you. I probably need to have that little insignia on the side that says you need to be discreet about who listens to this tape. And I'm a spiritual speaker, and I'm always amazed when they ask me to become a spiritual speaker. And I said, did you listen to my tape? (laughs) Are you sure that you want me to call that? Because, you know, I mean, Jesus, you better listen to that tape. (laughs) And they said, yes, yes, we listened to the tape. And I'd be like, oh, my God. You know, because I'm surprised they don't have, you know, out of all the 12-step programs, I don't know why we don't have a cussing anonymous. <laughs> because, then, you know, they got all of these things that, you know, that says in, in AA, N-A-C-A-G-A, you know, whatever, you know, with no profanity allowed. I don't understand that because that's a part of my alcoholism. I, I am not one of those cute little drunks. I'm not one of those people that got drunk, sat down, and just went to sleep and didn't say nothing. I'm not one of those people you saw out in the street and they was drunk and they were walking up right like they had since. They were sane and you say something to them and they were drunk and they'd say something like, excuse me. That wasn't me trying to get through the crowd. I'm the one that you heard way in the background. You could hear that voice. You could hear the words coming out of her mouth. And she was drunk and she was crazy and she was cussing everybody out. Or she was laid over in the corner. She was drunk and her legs was wide open. (laughs) 
but she was doing some heavy meditating. Because if you asked her, what was she doing? She said, you know, you just don't understand. I'm thinking. Now, that's me. Because I did a lot of things when I was out there drunk. I had dreams, aspirations, hopes, wishes. I had things that I wanted to do. I never sat down and said, I'm going to be the worst tramp in the world. I never sat down and thought I'd just give it all away to anybody. I never wanted to do that. I mean, as a little girl, I thought, Jesus, I'd like to grow up and meet some young man. And he bounced me home and said, look, Ma, what I found. Isn't she beautiful? That wasn't me. You know, at 11 and 12 years old, I was turning tricks. I mean, I discovered early that if I gave men what they wanted, they'd give me what I wanted. That was money. I'd like to tell you, I made a lot of money when I was out there. But I ain't the one. I'm a nickel and dime whore. Now, if you don't know what that means, let me break it down. <laughs> Because I had a disease even at 14, 15 years old. And my disease is that I was getting drunk by this time. And it didn't matter what it took for me to get drunk. See, because I'm one of those people that if a John came through and he had a six-pack of beer and a nickel bag of weed, I never asked for no money. That was enough. I got drunk. A lot of times I forgot to ask for it. I was one of those easy pieces. You know? Oh, don't worry about it. All you need to do is give her a six-pack. Give her a couple beers. She'll be okay. I'm one of those women that men, little young boys, ran trains on. You know, they say, meet me over in the alley in 15 minutes. And I'd go meet them, and they'd have two or three of their little friends with them. And they'd have a little brown paper bag in their hands with a bottle of wine, wild Irish rose, Thunderbird, a Boone Farm Alpha wine, Mad Dog 2020. I'm not a, a girlfriend said she was a high bottom drunk. I was so low that getting up just didn't cross my mind. You know, I am a low bottom drunk. I am there. I am one of those people that did whatever it took for me to get drunk. I went from city to city, from man to man, from woman to woman, doing whatever it took for me to feed the disease that I had no knowledge of. I did not know that I was addicted to alcoholism. I thought of alcohol as a way of life. I drank to live and live to drink. By the time I was 18 years old, I could not hardly walk from drinking alcohol. I had alcohol paralysis. And I still didn't stop drinking. You know, uh, by the time I was 23, 23 years old, my eyes had sunken back into my head and I weighed about 85 pounds and I was bloated and I couldn't control my bowels and my kidneys. I was dying. Alcohol was killing me. I am physically addicted to alcohol. When I drink, my body deteriorates. My mind is sober, but my emotions are drunk. I drank so much that the more I drank, the sober I got. But my body got drunk, and I couldn't walk. And I'm 22, I'm 17, I'm 18, I'm 21, and I'm asking somebody to love me in the same, at the same time. Just love me. I, if I could get somebody to just love me, I'd straighten up. So I'm one of those women that followed men to the end of the world. I'm one of those women that sat out on your car and waited for you all night long while you were with the other woman. And I'd come out, you'd come outside, and I'd ask you why. Why did you leave me? You know I love you. You know I want you. 
And he would say, Jojo, but I don't want you. Who wants somebody like you? Or I'd be in a bar. I don't know about you, but I went out to those bars to scope who I was going to see that night or who was going to be with me that night. And I had every intention of staying sober. I was just going to have a couple drinks. But by the time 2 o'clock come, I was so sloppy drunk. I'm a running drunk, I, you know, crawling all over the floor. You know, by the time 2 o'clock come, I was just totally wiped out. But again, my mind was sober. And I remember when this one particular night, I heard these two guys. Y'all may have heard the story. I share it all the time. And this, this, these two guys were standing in the, uh, in the bar. And, and one of them said, uh, man, what are you doing tonight? And he said, oh, man, I don't know. I'm probably going to go over to one of the after hour joints. I don't have anything else to do. He said, man, JoJo's over there. The other guy said, man, I don't fuck with nothing like that. And I heard that. And I looked in the mirror. And I wanted the earth to open up for me. Because I knew at that point, I had absolutely become nothing. Absolutely. I didn't graduate from high school. I'm talking about all of this stuff flashed through my mind. I was an eighth grade dropout. I had never done anything. I had never accomplished anything in my life. And at this point in time, I was 23 years old, and nobody wanted me. I'm the kind of little girl that nobody wanted anyone to know that they were with me. Don't tell anybody that I was with you. And that's hard to live down. I was ashamed of who I was. My family was ashamed of me. By this time, my family were looking at me, and my mom, I never will forget, my mom looked at me, and she went, mm, mm, mm. Now, you want to talk about an uh, ugly feeling. That's an ugly feeling for someone to say, I wish you were not my sister. I wish you were not my daughter. A disgrace to us. And my family had resigned the fact that I would die drunk, that someone would probably kill me that I would be found beat to death in some alley. They had resigned to the fact that that would happen to me and took insurance out on me. Just in case I died, they would be able to bury me. They wouldn't have to turn me over to the county for them to bury me, but they'd have, you know, enough money to at least put me away. They had resigned to the fact that I would die a drunken, Death out there. That was my mom's greatest fear. Is that some night some policeman would come and ask her to come identify a woman that had been beat to death in an alley. But at 23 years old, I had a rude awakening. I had DTs. I couldn't walk. It was on February the 14th of 1975. And I had done everything that an alcoholic woman could do. And on this particular night, death was riding my back. They were only so strong, I knew I was going to take my last breath if I went to sleep. And I was scared. My mom was in there, and she was in the bed, and she was passed out drunk, because I want you to know that I come from a family of alcoholism. That's all we knew. The people in my family that wasn't a drunk was an addict, drug addicts, or they was just plain crazy. I didn't have any sane folks in my family. And this particular night, I ran in there, and I jumped in the bed with my mom, and I put my arms around her. And the only thing I remember saying is, Mom, I'm sorry I didn't turn out to be something that you could be proud of. Sorry I didn't turn out like Max. And Max is my sister that did everything right. She graduated from high school, went into the Navy. Every young man she ever brought home was somebody. And they liked them. And I was never the one. But I envied my sister. I always wanted to be like my sister. And I come from a family of nine. There were six girls and three boys. And I'm the seventh child. But my mom was passed out. She didn't hear nothing I said that night. You could smell the alcohol in the air. Now, the derogatory way that I came to that night and my DTs 
you can smell that too. Because remember, I couldn't control my bowels and my kidneys. But for the first time in my life, my life, the only prayer that I could pray that night, because I knew that I was dying, only three words that came out of my mouth was, God, help me. And somehow, some way, he put me to sleep. And the next morning I woke up, it was February the 15th of 1975, and it was on a Sunday morning. And I got up, I don't even know how I got upstairs. I don't remember going upstairs. But I came down those steps, and I could hear the words as they went through my head. I know why you can't stop drinking, you're an alcoholic. And I came downstairs, and I picked up the telephone, and I dialed zero, long-distance operator. I said, my name is Jojo, and I'm an alcoholic. Can you give me some help? And this woman knew something about Alcoholics Anonymous. This operator knew something about it. And I'm from a little town in Ohio where I didn't know anything about AA. And she called a crisis center for me. And that woman came out later on that evening and took me to my first AA meeting the next day, which was a Monday. And she asked me, she says, can you not drink? And I told her, no. No, I can't not drink. I, I you know, I, I can't stop drinking. By this time, I was drinking Pabst Blue Ribbon beer, the big 16-ounce cans, and it was just foaming up. That's all it was doing was foaming up. And the next day, that Monday, took me to my first meeting that night. And I know you guys have heard this story over and over and over in Alcoholics Anonymous, where you go in and there's something magic in those rooms. There's something that happened. And I knew that I could not never, ever drink again. But I'm 23 years old. And I can't imagine life without drinking and using. Because what am I going to do for fun? How do you have sex without, I mean, without having something in your system? And it's not like I really had somebody to have sex with. <laughs> but you know how we are. And don't forget now, you know, I'm still turning tricks. Because that's all I know. But I went to my first meeting and I said, you know, I don't want to drink again. And this woman told me, if you follow what I follow, you shake this out. You never have to hurt from the abuse of alcohol again. <laughs> I said, just don't drink. <laughs> Call me before you take that drink. She says, come down to the health department because I work at the health department and we're going to put you on some stuff that will help you not drink. I said, okay. And I was there the first thing in the morning. And uh, I went to the health department. Because that was where their drug rehab type deal was. And uh, I got Anabuse, Valium, tranquilizers, sleeping pills. And I didn't drink. <laughs> and she told me about Anabuse. She said... Um, there's 250 milligrams you need to take every day, and, and if you drink on it, it'll kill you. That's what she said. So I doubled up on the abuse because I really didn't want to drink anymore. Now, they didn't say anything about not smoking weed, not taking diet pills, not tooting a little bit of Coke. They didn't tell me anything about that. So I didn't stop. So I came to the meetings, and they asked, how you doing, Jojo? I said, I'm fine tonight. Because <laughs> all we talked about is you just don't drink. That's what they tell you to talk about in Alcoholics Anonymous. You just don't drink, and they get pissed off if you say anything about drugs in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> For the next nine months, and I came to the meetings, and I didn't drink, but I came every night, and I either had a little weed in my purse or a whole bottle of pills. 
And I sat in these meetings and I wonder why I felt different. I wonder why I didn't fit. I wonder why you guys had that genuine look of sobriety and I didn't. And we didn't talk about it because if you did, they'd tell you, sit down. So it was in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that I almost died. In a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because we were not able to talk about what's really going on. I came to the meetings, I was still turning tricks. And you told me the only requirement for a member to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous is a desire to stop drinking. And I had a desire. I knew I couldn't drink. I knew that if I drink, I'd die. But you never said anything about drugs. And I didn't know I was a, an addict. I knew I was an alcoholic. I mean, knowledge have come now where I know it's a lot deeper than that. But I came to these meetings smoking weed. Taking pills, just not drinking. That ain't sobriety. Sobriety is clean and abstinence of all mind-altering chemicals. <laughs> and these people knew I was high. They pat me on my back and say, keep coming back, JoJo. One day your life will change. And I didn't know what they meant. 30 days clean and sober, 30 days around this program sober, and I say sober because I wasn't drinking. When they said if I kept coming back, my life would get better. And I was still turning those tricks. So I would go out on the corners. I, I used to have people that would come pick me up from the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, drop me off on the corner, take me to the AA meetings, and drop me back off on the corners because I had to go to work. Now, what I discovered of not drinking in this program is that I could ask for my money, <laughs> give them a great night, but knew what I was doing to a certain extent. And after 30 days of being around there, something happened. Because I, I, at that point, I was still asking for 10 and $15. I thought, Jesus, they said it was going to get better. So I was sitting around our round table, and I said, you, and it hit me. Just like it did that night, I had that moment of clarity. I went, damn, I could give myself a raise. <laughs> so 30 days of being in this program, I gave myself a raise <laughs> and got it. I mean, the jobs were like out there waiting on me. They would be out with the other prostitutes. The prostitutes be trying to get them, and they said, no, uh, we're going to wait on JoJo. She had an AA meeting. She'll be here about... <laughs> She'll be here a little about after 10, and I'd get there, and they were like, and they kept coming back. <laughs> so I went to the meetings, and I tell you guys, I said, girl, this program works. <laughs> You told me it was going to get better. <laughs> and I'm just here to tell you that if you don't, you don't have to stop turning tricks to get clean and sober in this program. You don't have to stop doing anything. But if you stay in this program, it will change. It will change. Nine months of being on this program, I was sitting in a meeting one night. And it was just as clear. It says, if you don't stop turning tricks and smoking dope, you're going to get drunk. I thought, Jesus Christ. I knew, I mean, it got scared. So I went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, November the 3rd, 1975. Actually, it was the 2nd. And I stood up in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I said, my name is Jojo. I'm an addict and an alcoholic, and I really, really want what you people have. He said, Jojo. Now's the time for you to. That I'm, that's what I'm doing. I'm getting honest. Nobody said to me, you need to go to CA or NA. They said, stand up and raise your hand for the next 30 days as a newcomer. And I stood up in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I raised my hand because I stopped smoking dope. And Alcoholics Anonymous. And I haven't used since then. It's been over 22 years. 
<laughs> and you know, I know that there's a lot of controversy, but it was back the same way it was 23 years ago. And I don't have to stand up here today and, and, and just get graphic on the drugs that I've used. I don't need to do that, but I do need to acknowledge that I am dual addicted. But I also realize that the addiction that I have stems from alcoholism. That I am an alcoholic foremost, and that's the number one is where I'm at on that. And that it doesn't matter what I induce in my system, I'm going to get drunk. What I discovered for me is that if I kept coming back to this program, all kinds of doors would open for me. And in 1975, I made a decision to stay here. And I remember telling God that if you want me to be this miserable, I will be, if you will let me stay clean and sober. I am willing to do whatever it takes. And I made a decision in 1975 to follow what you follow. And that's the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, six months clean and sober, I met a man at the podium, at the coffee pot. Now, I didn't come in here to meet no man, because it's important that you know I walked in here a lesbian. I had on boots, blue jeans, and a bebop hat. I talked out the side of my neck. But about six months after being here, I met this young man who called me a lady. I, God, I hadn't been called a lady in so long. I had to look around and see who he was talking about. And wasn't nobody standing behind me, which scared me. But I let this gentleman take me home, not that night. But I had a sponsor, and I need to share this with you. My sponsor said, you're a liar, you're a manipulator, you're a con artist, and you need to be honest with this young man and tell him who you are. What do you mean? <laughs> she said, before you sleep with him, you need to tell him what, who you are. And I said, why? She said, so that you don't have to fool him. So I did. I told him, I said, look, we need to talk. My sponsor said that I, can't, I can only uh, be honest with you, and i got to tell you who I am. And, and, uh, and I told him, you know, my, I'm a lesbian, and, and I... I guess I'm a lesbian. I, I like women. And I like men, so I don't know what I am. But I remember his words to me, and he said to me, Jojo, if you can stay sober with it, I can live with it. I want to marry you anyway. And we got married. Eighteen months clean and sober in this program, I got married to that young man. And I got married in a big white wedding dress with some Cinderella slippers, <laughs> gray, big old veil. And he took me home to meet his mama and his daddy. He said, look, Ma, what I found. <laughs> and a year after we were married, I always wanted a baby. Remember those dreams of wishes, hopes that I had when I was laid over in the corner? I used to dream about the White House with the picket fence and being a mama. Now, at 19 years old, they told me I'd never be able to have any children. I had caught some community diseases. <laughs> and I ain't talking about the common cold or the flu, either. <laughs> I had to have some emergency surgery. And they told me that I'd probably, because of the scar tissue, I'd probably never be able to have any babies. But a year after I was married to this young man, I had this dream or this wish, or this hope. I wanted a baby. I wanted to know what it would be like to be a mama. And I'd go to these AA meetings, especially the women's meetings, and I'd talk about what I wanted to be. And someone said, whoever said that you have to physically have a child to become a mama? And I, and I could, you know what, I could not comprehend that, and I was like, well, how am I supposed to have a baby? <laughs> So she didn't get the point. I, you know, I wanted to see the belly grow. So I went to some infertility, infertility places, and they tried everything. and just wasn't going to work for me. But I was in another meeting, and a woman said, you know, why don't you try adopting a child? 
I said, girl, you know they ain't gonna let me have that one of them babies. <laughs> she said, why don't you try? So I called up the Los Angeles Adoption Center. Told them who I was, told them I was an alcoholic and I wanted a baby. <laughs> And they told me to come down. So me and my husband went down to the Los Angeles Adoption Center. And we had an interview with this social worker. And we talked. And, and she said, tell me a little something about yourself. And by this time, I learned rigorous honesty. So I told him everything. The longer I talked to that woman, the bigger her eyes got. And I had married a man straight out of Camarillo. That's a nut house. He had been there two or three times. And I told her everything. Actually, I didn't tell her anything about him, but when, when she went to go get some papers, he said to me, he said, uh, are you, you're not going to tell her that uh, you was a prostitute, are you? And I said, no, and I ain't going to tell him you was a nut either. <laughs> and when the lady came back, she said to us, you know, we've never had your kind here before. <laughs> we don't know if we can help you, but we'll do the best we can. She's a young, young woman. Anyway, we left, my heart kind of sank. And I looked up at him, and I said, well, you know, Jerome, they're not going to let us have any of those babies. He said, J.J., why you said it? I said, well, let's face some reality. I'm an old whore, and you're a nut. <laughs> We're the kind of people they take kids from. <laughs> but you see, he had a little more time than I had, and the spirituality of the program has set in on him. And he said, you know what? We've done the footwork. Let's leave the results up to God. And we went on with our lives. And ladies, I want you to know that 15 months later, I got a letter in the mail that said I had been approved. <laughs> we went to Downey, California, to the most beautiful white woman I had ever met in my life. And she was the most spiritual woman I ever met. And she had this beautiful little black baby. He was 11 months old. He was the prettiest gorgeous little boy that I had ever seen and um, you could say Jesus Christ and he just clapped his hands because she had taught him that and uh, two weeks later I got to, to go back and get this little boy and take him home and he was 11 months old and uh, got to watch him grow up see one of the things that God said and I say God said and I believe that anything you want in this program, you can have. I believe you got to be willing to do the footwork and have faith. Because God said, I'm going to give you a gift. You have some tools to work with. you got to become the best mommy that you know how to be. And he's just a gift. Remember, once he's 18 years old, he comes back to me. So for 18 years, God in this program let me be the best mommy that I could be. Last September, my son turned 18 years old. And I got to tell you, there's nothing like having a little boy, he's still my little boy, that says to you, you're the best mommy in the whole world. You know, and I love you. My, I mean, this boy loved me, and I know he loves me unconditionally. And that's all I ever wanted was someone to love me unconditionally. And he loves me. He joined the Navy, so he's in the Navy. You know, me and his father didn't stay together. Our sicknesses got better. <laughs> so we moved on. But he was a great father. He still is a great father. And I moved on. It was time to go on. At 12 years sober on this program, I completely fell apart. 
but I had some tools to work with. So I left that marriage, and I got into another one. I'm a fast one. I don't see any reason to be abstinence. I do not understand women that stay celibate for two years, three years. For why? I don't understand that shit. Talk about we healing. And as soon five, they can stay celibate for five, six years, and as soon as they get some, they back where they was. Try, you know what I mean? They still crazy in love, going through the changes. So what the hell? I ain't treating my body like that. No. No. Uh-uh. I know some women that don't even masturbate for six, seven years. I don't understand. But I got into another relationship in this program. And we got married. This man wanted to marry me, too, and that's amazing. And a um, year and a half ago, and I want to talk about that, a year and a half ago, um, I made a decision to, to leave this marriage again. So this is my second marriage in sobriety that I've left. Uh, I was with the first one for 12 years, second one for eight years. And um, I know for me... Uh, you know, I, I wish I was one of those people that had, you know, the 20, 30, and 40 years that couples are together. Um, but for me, and see, I've always had my dependency on a man or a woman. I've always had my dependency on, on them. Because I'm the one that if you show me some affection, I make you need me. I have the, t I know how to make you need me. I manipulate, I'm a con artist, I know how to do it. You not you will not be independent. You will be a cold dependent when you when I finish with you. <laughs> the hardest time that I've had. This has been a hard time for me, but it has been the best time that I've had in my whole sobriety with the last year and a half. And it's been hard. I, I'm not going to tell you because when I walked away, I left everything. I walked away. And I made a decision since my son was grown and I could make it on my own. I tried to make it on my own. I had gotten into a job that um, paid commission on me. Scared to death. I only had just got this job. I didn't have any. I, I was leaving a three-bedroom condo, you know, fully furnished, and I decided to leave. I told him a year ago Christmas. I'm going to talk about this. Uh, that was be, uh, before my son went into the service. Uh, my son gave me a book that morning on Christmas, and the book was by Dr. Susan Ford, Men Who Hate Women and the Women Who Love Them. And it's uh, the gift that he gave me, and, I, and his, this boy at that time was 17 years old. And I was like, oh, I started crying, and I thought, why did you give me this book? Why, it's Christmas. Why couldn't you give me something else? <laughs> And he said, Mom, I hear you crying all the time at night. I know you're miserable. I know you're unhappy. And I can't handle it. I don't want to live with you anymore. I want to go with my dad. My son left me, and he went to go live with his father until he graduated. He only had six months left to graduate, but he, was, he couldn't handle me because I was crying. I was miserable. I was unhappy. I couldn't. On that Christmas day, I sat up in the middle of the bed with no money. I had only been on my job for about three weeks, going on a month. And I told him, I said, I'm moving out. And on January the 7th, I moved out. I have a girlfriend in the program that sent me $1,000. And I want you to do what you find necessary to do with it. So I took that $1,000. And I went and I found a little bachelor rent, and I paid for it. And I had no furniture. I had nothing. And the little storage that I had found to put my wedding gifts in and my artwork in, uh, there was a sign over the rental place that says, Rent for us, we'll move you free. So I went home and packed all my shit up, and they came and moved me. And I moved out on nothing but faith. 
I had nothing. I went in the office and I told these people where I was working that I was going to have to quit because my rent was $375 and I was working on commission and I needed to make sure that I could live, that I could pay my rent for the next month. So I was going to quit. And this guy told me, don't quit. Give me 30 days. If you haven't made $375, I will give you $375 then you can quit. So I stayed on this job and I worked this job and I made $4,200. <laughs> So I paid my rent. <laughs> and that's how I got started a year and a half ago. I mean, nothing. And I want to tell you guys something. There is nothing like starting over all over again with 21 years of sobriety. And you walk out of a house, you leave everything, and you don't have nothing. And you think, what the fuck have I done? I've been sober for 21 fucking years, and I don't have nothing. I'm miserable. What? And you, you start thinking, what's the use? See, you guys don't understand. There's a lot of us at 20, 21, and 22 years get loaded. Because we don't want to come and tell you what's really going on in our lives at 20, 21, and 22 years old. Because we on this prideful trip. You know, your people look at us and think, you've been sober for 21 years and you ain't no better than that. $75. But if I go try to get me a one bedroom or two bedroom, we're talking about $500, $600. I'm on commission. Only. I'm scared again. I said, what am I going to do? So I call up my landlord and I tell her, I got to move. You know, I need at least a one bedroom. My baby want to come home. And like any good mother, we're going to make preparations for our babies. And I went to go find me an apartment with a one bedroom, something that I could afford. And she said, Jojo, what can you afford? I said, I probably can't afford no more than another hundred dollars, which was the truth. She said, well, I have a two-bedroom that's available. I said, I can't afford to pay what you're asking for. She said, well, give me what you can and move up there. So I, now, you remember, I moved into a two-bedroom. I ain't got no furniture. Remember, I ain't got no furniture. And I paid $475. I move into this two-bedroom apartment, and I ain't got no furniture. Let me tell you how God works. The next month, I make $6,000. The finance lady told me, go exempt. Get all your money this month. And then change your W-2 back. 
I said, okay. <laughs> so I got all of my money, and I went and bought a house full of furniture, paid cash for it, brand new furniture, and brought it home. And I went back to change my W-2 form back. So now I got, I'm in a two-bedroom apartment. I got a house full of furniture that's paid for. Then the young man on my job says, you know, I bought this aquarium. And I hate it. I don't like the maintenance of it. And this man paid over $800 for this thing. I mean, one of my dreams were always I wanted an aquarium. So I don't want me an aquarium. I've got this really, he said, I'll sell it to you. And I said, for how much? He said, $500. I said, I can't afford to keep it. I just kept on moving. He said, well, how much would you, how much could you afford? I said, $200. He said, sold. So I went straight to the ATM, gave him his $200, and the next morning he delivered this tank set with the stand, the everything, everything to go to it. So I set it up. Salt water. I don't want no fresh water. I cut the cable. I didn't want cable. I cut, I, I said, if I'm going to do something for me, what am I willing to sacrifice? I don't want cable. I watch videos all the time. So I had the cable cut off, and I had the long distance cut off of my phone so I could have a maintenance guy come and take care of my salt water tank. <laughs> so I have a beautiful tank. I get up in the mornings. I don't really drink a lot of coffee, and I can watch this tank. And this, you should see my little place. It is so cute. <laughs> and it's all mine. And I get up now, and I walk through your house, and I, I, you know, I live alone. And for the first time in my life, I am not dependent on another person to make me happy. I mean, I enjoy sleeping by myself. That don't mean I don't want somebody in my life. And I didn't say I was alone. But I don't have to have it. Now, I don't have nobody living with me, and I don't think I'm going to be doing that for quite some time. I don't expect to be alone for the rest of my life. I don't want to do that. But I want him to have his place, or she to have her place. Depends on what I turn out to be. <laughs> and I'm going to have mine. And once you come over and you leave the next day, I look around and make sure you ain't left nothing. <laughs> if you bring a toothbrush, you leave with a toothbrush. You know how we always leave something? I go checking now. I even look under the bed to make sure no underwear is under there. God has truly been good to me. I am truly blessed. You know, um... God has given me an opportunity to walk in my own personal brand of dignity. I'll hold my head up high. I am not ashamed of who I am and where I come from. It's very important for me to talk about where I'm at today. Not what it, I mean, it's important for me to talk about what it used to be like. But I don't need to project the image that I am not. It's important that you know that life is still happening to me. You know, when I got sober, one of my biggest fears is that I'd lose my, lose my mom. And I know what death is. It's important that you know I know what death is. I've lost four siblings and a mom since I've been sober and another sibling that I just went home that I'll probably never get a chance to see again. But I got to go home three weeks ago, spend a week with her. And you know what was really nice? I was able to go home and rent a car Whatever she wanted. And I cooked for her. I went and bought the food and all of that. And I didn't have to say, well, did you have some money? Do you know like I used to do? And I, I'd call her up and I'd say, I'm over at so-and-so and so-and-so. Uh, I'm getting myself something to eat. What do you want? And for the whole week, I was able to treat her like that. And I got to tell you, when I got on that plane coming back home, the only thing that I could think of was, service, what you had taught me to do. And what I also discovered is that when anyone anywhere reaches out for me, I need to be responsible whether they're for Alcoholics Anonymous or not. Yeah. 
It's important. And if they're not clean and sober, I still need to be there for them. Because they need love, they need patience, they need tolerance, they need me. And I need to be a positive force in their life. I don't need to set up, and you know we do, and it's important for me to touch on this. For some particular reason, I know today I'm, I need to. You know, as women, we sometimes judge each other. We're negative. And we can be very hurtful to each other. And one of the things that we have to learn to do is love beyond color. Y'all love, love beyond race and love beyond sex. We need to reach out. We need to, woman to woman. We need to know that when we walk away from each other, that we leave a feeling of love, faith, importance, making them feel proud of who they are. It's important for us to put our arms around each other and love and kiss and pat on the back and not put down, but put forth. That's what God gives us. The ability to love unconditionally. And let me tell you something. If you don't practice it in these rooms, you can't practice it in your principles and your affairs outside of these rooms. When you talk about practicing principles in all of our affairs, it don't just apply out there on our jobs. It really applies here in these rooms. And it's important for us. I got to tell you, there are a lot. And don't you ever think that it's not. There are women who don't speak to me. There are women who don't like me for whatever. It could be the way I talk. It could be the way I dress. It could be the way, you know, and there. But it's not important to me that they don't speak to me. But if I look at them, I better speak to them. I better say, if I don't do nothing, if I can't do nothing, but just go. Because right. <laughs> it ain't them I got the free. It's me I got the free. It's me when I lay down, I don't have that crap running through my head and I can go to sleep. And I can say to myself, thank you, God, I've done the best that I could do this day. And I know, I, I'm sorry I didn't bring my big book. But there's a passage that I love reading about. And I'll let you guys go home with this. I won't even say the passage. But it's in, in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, page 91. Excuse me. I retract that. It's in the 12 and 12, page 91. And if you want to know what a uh, rude awakening is in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, go home and read that. I'm not the big book bumper, and I don't quote, and I don't do all of that, but I know there are certain things that make me feel good when I read it. There are certain things that become clear in my mind when I read it. There are certain things that I understand when I read it that make me know that I, too, must work a hell of a program in order to stay clean and sober in this program. You guys have touched me. You know, I've had a weekend full of nothing but women. Friday through Sunday. What's amazing is I was able to share at a meeting in, in Los Angeles. And I'm here in Sacramento, Sacramento on a Sunday morning doing the same thing. Now I must be willing to go to any length. <laughs> what you've given me I can never thank you enough for. God bless you. I thank you. And I love you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.